Sunday afternoon, I happened to be Googling on my computer, and I got this bing. And um, what pops up on my email was a text from Eric Moss. Can you do John Enright's lectures intro? Which, of course, I say sure, because unfortunately, he couldn't do it tonight. And um, so, um, you know, I prepare for the introduction and get it all ready. And then I was just packing my computer at noon today, and another bing come up, and then Eric shoot me John's introduction. Um, so I say to Eric, I say, you know what? Mm, what do you want me to do with this? I mean, I can't impersonate you. Um, so I'm just going to give both introduction, and you have to guess when it happened. <laughs> and when is Eric and when is me? What is a wall? <laughs> a roof, a floor, a window. Once upon a time, there was a notorious architect whose client called in the middle of the night to complain about a leaking roof. The architect arrived at the house examined the pool of water on the floor and pulled a piece of paper from his pocket. Excitedly, the client watched, anticipating a sketch that would solve the problem. Instead, the architects folded the paper in the shape of a boat, floated the paper boat in the puddle, then turned and walked away. One thing we all know for a certainty the architect wasn't John Enright. Enright's roof never leaked. John Cage, a sailor in that paper boat, composed four minutes and 33 seconds in 1952. No strings, no winds, no persecution, no score. So what's music? John Enright was listening and transpose the cage paradigm. If the popular conception of Los Angeles as a forum to experiment, experiment and then experiment again, needs any confirmation, it can be found in the work of John Enright and Margaret Griffin. If you ever wonder what goes on underneath, under your front lawn, or if there is anything in the world more challenging than a Rubik's Cube, it can be found in the work of John Enright and Margaret Griffin. And if you ever just wanted something down home and direct, like a glass of cold beer, it can be found in the work of John Enright and Margaret Griffin. What's a wall? A roof, a floor, a window. So what's architecture? Without an a priori score, now you guess. <laughs> Enright perseveres. Put it together, take it apart, over and over again. Parts poetic, parts pragmatic, looking for a means to weight the ends, looking for ends to validate the means. Enright hasn't arrived at the permanent resolution. Enright hasn't defined an enduring aspiration. Nor is he comfortable with this discomfiture of irresolution. Some architects build for an audience. John Enright is building for himself. Some architects build to confirm what they already know. Enright is building in order to learn. These are the folks that declare that Schindler's house on King's Road 
is, more, is modded out. Outscale, outcast, before lovingly wrapping in it a foil of subterranean rams. And they are the same folks who imagine the future, that the future would have a place for a portable wide band workplace, which is just that, a wide band. There is a genuine sense of discovery throughout their work. Their fascination with simple, direct, yet intriguing design solution. Solution which seem to be transferred directly from the search that produced them is a welcome rebuttal to the process-driven inevitability of many of their peers, while the humorous subtext, the puns, inversions, and mirrored references hint at the complex but ultimately accessible agenda. What's a wall, a roof, a floor, a window? He's got moving parts and a moving whole. So far, it's a model, Enright can model. Enright is not searching, Enright is not in search of a generic pro forma. Enright's not looking for others to learn his lesson. Perhaps he is asymptotic to a solution. Perhaps there's the prospect of a clear direction. Let's call the end right direction playing hide and seek with technique. The leak free roof will never show a vent. That accessibility, that rare combination of creativity and no nonsense, let's just get on with it process, is what John brings to SIAC. He's Mr. Fix It with a higher calling the guys who can hotwire your brain while he scraped the glue off his fingers. A natural leader, John's decision to combine his professional activity with those of a teacher, and his willingness to share the lesson learned from practice with students who are about to enter a field which is all the more valuable, especially when we are seen against the emphasis of imagery which has proliferated in recent years. Poise, calm, precise, efficient. Idealistic, probably not. Utopian, no chance. Emotive, unlikely. As John Case taught, drip, 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 isn't the sound of silence. Please welcome John Enright to SIAC. Wow. Um, you know, I really thought, you know, I got that email too, that Eric wasn't going to give the introduction and a huge wave of relief hit me. So uh, your first words, you know, when you started, I thought, oh no, here it is. But uh, you did it well, and you do a good impression. I also do a very excellent Eric Moss impression, but uh, this is being taped, and I, I'm not going to do it. Um, thank you all for coming, and um, I have far too many slides, uh, and I'm going to try, I tend to go through them fairly quickly, um, which is a good thing for everyone, and I'm going to try to make this an hour. Um, and I, I, uh, because I tend to go off in tangents, I, I have to read a, a beginning intro, and forgive me for that, and then after that I'll go through the projects and uh, uh, kind of riff on them. Um, excuse me. Um, one thing, as most of you know, uh, and the word Enright kept coming up in our fearless leader's words, um, the work I showed tonight is the result of my partnership with Margaret Griffin. We've all heard others acknowledge partners, associates, and colleagues, but to simply say that we collaborate would be a serious understatement. Each project we work on gets equal dose of our attention, and it's the back and forth dialogue that we've been continuing to refine for many years now that results in what I'll show you tonight. 
This dialogue is an ongoing conversation, and one, is, one that is the best kind of collaboration. Brutally honest, passionate, and most of all, steeped in admiration. We chose many years ago to combine our energies in many things in our lives, and this work is but one chapter from the last 11 years. We've lectured together often, actually, but we decided for the sake of not detaining you for over two hours uh, that I would get the draw this time. So next one's yours. I also want to thank all the people in our office, uh, which is currently Gian, Christine, Brian, Lucia, Nanao, Joe, Kefilway, Kylie, and Francine. Now you know how many people are in the office. Uh, and the many others who uh, contributed over the years. These two images are the same thing, though they represent two very different spatial conditions. One horizontal, one vertical. One essentially skims the earth, the other digs down. One is more modern, one centuries old. On the left, the ubiquitous freeway, a ribbon network continuously linking us through space. On the right, St. Patrick's Well in Orvieto, the double helix ramp system servicing a continuous path to extract water from the ground. Actually, Marianne Ray wrote a piece in pamphlet architecture years ago on that project, very interesting. Both also represent a notion of continuity of movement through architectural form. That is to say that the morphology of each is both in service to the scale and speed of those engaged in it, as well as deeply orchestrating movement through space. Our work is interested in the manners in which we navigate through space and the resultant forms architecture can explore that choreograph this dance. We're not so interested in objects, they seem too much like dead ends for us. We're much more comfortable thinking of the continuum of human movement as it pertains to the work. In the office, this seems to come up time and time again. How do you walk through? How do you move from this position to that? How are these movements linked? Where do the conflicts arise? Where should they arise? How can we make a form, a surface, a link that both engages the human experience of space through time and embraces disruptions. Both of these images are essentially idealized systems and inherently infrastructure. They do not adapt that well. They're monotonous and single-minded. Our architecture differs from this situation in that while it is inexorably linked to the constant flows of human movement, it is also where interaction and spatial conflict occur. Architecture is where the flows are disrupted, where the car crashes, and where the water bucket spills over. In addition to our interest in what I'll call the continuity of movement, in many of our projects, there's a purposeful questioning of the problem at hand. And we believe that architecture has a responsibility to give more than it takes in this regard. That is to say that while program site, use, etc., are inevitable problems that architecture caters to, we believe that architecture is at its best when it invents solutions to problems that on the face of things might not yet exist. It is within these two major avenues that I wish to speak about tonight, and uh, one that is inherently outside of the specific projects, in other words, our interests in movement and continuity, and the other a more opportunistic avenue involving ideas that question what the project may be in our own terms. I should point out that, Mar that both Margaret and I, and maybe this is where the leaky roofs come in, have always had a great love for the act of building when confronted with the difficult circumstances of budget and schedule that all of us face, we go about the pursuit of built form enthusiastically and with the notion that larger ideas can be pursued and tested towards informing the work down the road. We've been lucky and that for 10 years we've always had at least one project under construction. And we've realized that we're not building something, even if it's small, we tend to get a bit edgy and uncomfortable. I'm going to show 12 projects that offer a sampling of the work from the last 10 years. Other than the first and last projects, they're not necessarily in chronological order. The first project small, the last one and the latest somewhat larger. This first project, uh, one we did about 10 years ago, was for CalArts in Valencia. You're looking at... Um, I love pointers, I'm going to point a lot. Uh, this is the uh, giant, brutalist concrete building of CalArts. Uh, and we were uh, given 
the opportunity to look at a small corner of it, which, uh, as you can see in the site, was at the edge of these internal maze-like corridors that exist at CalArts. Very small project, uh, uh, and one that uh, for us was defined as a kind of link. We, many requirements on this, we couldn't touch the envelope, we couldn't touch the doors, this and this existed. Uh, and from the site, we realized that this was really a pathway, that this project was something one walked through. Uh, and there was a certain kind of diagonal, obviously, uh, condition between the exit and entry door. And uh, like architecture schools, it was a 24-7 kind of operation, whereas as a student lounge and a, a bookstore and a cafe, students are coming in and out of the school from the dorms to the uh, school itself through this kind of portal. So in that way, uh, the project developed really as a kind of piece of furniture in our minds. We couldn't break through the ceiling. We couldn't do things at the floor. Uh, it also, uh, for a project of, of relatively small means, each piece of it had to have kind of double service. So uh, this kind of bilateral uh, notion of material, plywood and, and uh, translucent material, each wall, each piece of the ceiling, uh, either displayed uh, for uh, exhibition work, lit the space, became furniture, etc. All these pieces kind of had this uh, uh, double duty. So, uh, of course, like all architects, when you're given uh, one of your first projects, you you know try to take every single piece of it. So we're modeling, of course, every stud and all the screws uh, and attachments, etc. Making a kind of small project into maybe a bigger one, and uh, here you see uh, the final built project was built very quickly. When you're uh, not allowed to break through the glass and you want to express this kind of inside and outside, the the way around it is just build right up to the glass inside and outside. Steve Martin used to have this kind of arrow through the head. This is this trick, you know. Uh, uh, so it, we didn't break the glass; <laughs> we worked around it in that way. Um, Ming mentioned this project, another small one. Uh, this is the LA Mart in downtown Los Angeles. This is basically a tomb for interior materials. Uh, we had never been there before. We were asked to uh, uh, do a temporary space, uh, which the aim of the project was to uh, use these certain materials that they were going to give us or we were allowed to, to pursue our own and be a kind of mall, in a mall-like setting, uh, create a kind of showroom, excuse me, for these materials. It's basically a kind of commercial enterprise. Um, our first thought of that was we weren't very interested in it. Uh, secondly, then, uh, uh, Margaret went to 3Form and started talking to them and got them to donate a bunch of material. And instead of uh, making it a kind of diorama kind of project, we said, well, we're going to use your material, but we're going to make it a hangout space and a bar. And we think more people will come to a bar than they would to view this kind of diorama of materials. So this is the basic premise of the project. So here you see the plan of it, and it's uh, obviously this uh, you know, tomb of a building, like a storage space, no windows, uh, these kind of relentless corridors, and we were given this tiny little space. So the project essentially became a kind of wrapper uh, using uh, this uh, interesting material that simultaneously was translucent uh, as well as structurally uh, extremely strong, so three quarters inch thick. And the tectonics of it became a kind of dance of celebrating this continuous loop of this form that simultaneously modulated the space, uh, uh, emanated a translucency, and was again a kind of piece of furniture where wall, floor, ceiling, table all became kind of one. So here you see our, our uh, models of it. We called it wide band. At the time, it was uh, interesting to give people free Wi-Fi, and it was, it was also a place you could take your computer and sit, et cetera. So this is the final piece. Uh, we were interested in, it was a piece that you could walk on, sit in, and also have to navigate around. So the form and the way the twists work both slide you inside and outside in this kind of continuity of movement through the piece.
And of course, uh, the best way to get people to come to uh, your space is give them free wine and beer, which is what we did. Uh, and these are all uh, Syrac students from uh, a few years ago, I think, from <laughs> Margaret's studio. <laughs> uh, but it actually worked this way. It gravitated, people came in and wanted to hang out there. They didn't even know what this material was. There was no advertising, etc., cetera. Uh, and it worked really well in that, in that regard. Uh, this is a project for SciArc uh, uh, called Mobile Exposure. This was a competition that uh, uh, Eric and, and, and Ming and Chris Gennick, I think at the time, sponsored uh, for SciArc faculty for a new cafe. Of course, everyone should know that Marcelo Spina, who's here, uh, uh, won it, so we didn't win. Uh, but I, 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 there's something in this project that uh, particularly SciArc students tend to, tend to like. Um, we questioned the brief from the very beginning. Uh, the brief, this, in this case, our leaders of the school said the cafe should be down uh, at the north end in a fixed spot. And uh, to us, we thought, well, that, that might not be the best way to go with a place like SciArc. I mean, we all know this building. We know the, the, the moving back and forth that we do. Uh, and we really started looking at the beginnings of the building, of course, as we all know, trains on my right, trucks on our left. This building's essentially a cipher of merchandise uh, in its previous originally designed state. So we came up with an idea to reappropriate the train lines that are uh, actually existing right now, uh, still in the pavement. And we uh, found out on eBay that you could buy the chassis of a uh, train carcass for about 40 grand, it turned out. Uh, and we thought, well, if we use that as a base, we could develop actually a kind of uh, a kitchen that moved up and down the building, uh, wrapped with solar panels. We were interested in this unisolar, flexible solar panel. And then, in fact, conceptually, uh, SARC has, of course, m multiple centers. Here we are in the main space. It could be parked here, down at gallery shows, and then have a kind of main uh, uh, kind of uh, docking station at the end. Um, so the development of the project then was really about that movement. I love this image. It looks as if the thing's going about 40 miles an hour. But the idea was actually it would be like a slow moving blimp, you know, like when you see a blimp on the freeway and then you kind of look away and then all of a sudden it's over there. It would be this thing that slid up and down SciArc that you never really knew where it was, which would require you to come out and see where it is to engage in the cafe. Um, so we had a lot of fun with this project. Uh, uh, of course, at the time, I, I didn't realize that Sark, well, of course, at the time, we didn't even own the building, so it was kind of a crazy premise to begin with. Uh, uh, but of course, we don't, we don't own that piece of property that's on that edge in any case. So we were kind of screwed from the beginning, to tell you the truth. Uh, uh, but we took it very seriously. And uh, the, you know, the structure was actually balanced uh, uh, on this piece. The cornice becomes an I-beam with a hook on it with this uh, a rail. And we worked with some structural engineers looking at uh, the structure of it and how it would balance, et cetera. And not, not nearly enough solar material on the object itself. So we proposed, of course, taking the whole roof uh, as solar material also. Of course, at the time, Sark was uh, embroiled in some interesting political maneuverings with certain developers uh, next door. And so uh, we thought this might scare that. That's the suit running away from the object <laughs> on site. Um, uh, so, and various other individuals. Um, and then, you know, of course, it's kind of a subway, so you have to have the yellow stripe at the loading dock as this thing moves back and forth. Um, I like this uh, low-res quick image because it, first of all, talks about the dogs of Sciarc, which this is, of course, a wolf, but, uh, um, <laughs> but it also talks about the, the kind of uh, nighttime energy of the place and uh, the ability of uh, this building, as we, uh, of course, all know, as we approach from the west, has no entry, really. It has multiple entries, and uh, new visitors are always confused, kind of, where the hell do I enter this building? Uh, but that it could be kind of a kind of beacon that, that would be that point as this kind of uh, exterior cafe. And, the, and of course, the, the nighttime, late night of all the students, of course, understand quality uh, I like in this image. Uh, this next project is a, is a commission that, uh, uh, I don't know, we, we may actually not even have this commission anymore. I'm not sure. Um, it's been kind of on hold in the office. It was a project we did about three years ago. And uh, hopefully, we hope that it continues, although it sounds like it's going to be in a different kind of uh, 
uh, situation. This is uh, Venice, Abbott Kinney Boulevard, uh, right here. And uh, uh, the project is 16 condos in this state, although this may change. Uh, and the renovation, uh, some of you might know Joe's Restaurant and Lily's. Uh, right now it's a big parking lot in the back. Uh, and we were asked to, to do a proposal for uh, 16 condos, a little office piece. And what's interesting about the site is there's a tiny little embedded garden uh, run by this guy, Jerry, who's kind of been there for many years. So uh, what interested us with the project, this is a very simple plan, was this internal garden and these kind of alleyways of Venice. And, and in fact, that we concentrated on that kind of aspect. Uh, the, the client wanted to keep the existing buildings pretty much the same. So our piece is really this and this. And it was a problem of actually how to entice that kind of movement in a very small space, in a very intimate space. Um, so we placed these artist studios uh, on the backs and essentially a walk street edge. Um, but more importantly to us were the surfaces involved with that movement and that continuity through. So uh, it's kind of two pieces like this that lock into place with roof gardens on the top. The kind of traditional or, or more, uh, let's say, public facade on electric is this, which was about uh, uh, kind of disintegrating the notion of individual units and creating a kind of family of form on this edge. And this edge, again, was uh, uh, this uh, idea of the solar kind of uh, surface. Uh, the fact that it's solar, and I have to say that it's sustainable and all of those things, um, um, wasn't the primary generator of it. What was interesting, uh, here you see the unit plans, what was interesting to us was this notion of a surface that could mediate between movement of what is essentially a linear system back and forth within the individual units and take you up to the roof garden. So these pieces that hook up are actually these stairs that cut in, all having to do with some kind of notion of this continuity from the public space through connecting to the garden and then back. Fairly straightforward. Uh, this next project is uh, probably the biggest project we've done, and it's just recently completed. It's a school. It's a school um, right here at Normandy, uh, just south, uh, Normandy and 15th, just south of Pico. Um, it's a, a, a small school, K to 8, uh, that we worked on for many years, and it's, it's just finally finished uh, last year. Um, probably one of the toughest projects we've done, uh, many constraints with it. Um, it's in a very interesting part of the city. This is Normandy here. Um, this is the property, this is Loyola High School on the side. This is actually the church that's associated with this uh, parochial school. Uh, it had an existing building on it, uh, which was a 1930s building, which we, we kept. And the program was a whole lot of parking because this little church here services 8,000 families in, in this area. They have uh, something like 10 to 12 services on the weekends. And everybody was parking on the school. So basically the school's playground was a giant parking lot. Uh, and they needed a new multi-purpose space, uh, new library, uh, uh, and, and, and new um, art classroom. So <clears throat> we worked on this in many different versions uh, 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 along the years. Um, but the main thing we were interested in, and, and this didn't come from their brief, um, they really just needed space, you know? I mean, that was a really down and dirty, we just need uh, some rooms. Um, but the project had some interesting pressures. One was that there was an inherent connection from the church to uh, the, 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 the facility where people would park. Um, there was the existing building, and um, what we did was create actually a big open exterior space, which was never really needed, never really required. And uh, at the end, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about it. Um, so it was something we fought for, of course, and, and the project ultimately became about this kind of exterior room in a very straightforward way. But it had some kind of surprising results, which I'll show you at the end. In terms of the movement of the project, uh, we internalized this road uh, with schools, a big issue with drop off, et cetera. So the road loops around one way, which goes down, you'll see in a, a series of diagrams in a minute. This is the existing building, 
bridge had to be phased. They had to stay in the school while we built this, et cetera, et cetera. Underground parking here, playground on top, no parking allowed, and a small parking in the front. Big ramp up that aligns with that street and that connection into this exterior room, and then, of course, the multi-purpose area. Uh, classrooms here, kitchen, et cetera. I should mention that uh, this was the first project where really building information modeling was used, which is, uh, of course, people who know us and know that we're interested in that kind of stuff and this kind of notion of the total uh, uh, ultimate construction documents control of the architect where renderings are actually construction documents and there's many of us here working on that kind of thing. Um, this was a good project to kind of run that through the office. Um, uh, and, and where, of course, architecture is going today and, and many of us experimenting with at SciArc. <clears throat> so this is the diagram of the, the loop road, which is depressed with the, the, the lower uh, parking. The loop comes around. This becomes a drop-off, right? So the big long line of cars is around the edge and this comes up. And ultimately, the, the, the circulation internally from up the stair connecting back into the existing building uh, and its stairways and this kind of perch that overlooks the open space. So this is uh, the final project. <clears throat> so for us, this exterior room, it has some certain things. Everything in this project had double duty. Uh, you know, everything from the you know, the, the, the benches at the bottom of the, uh, the kind of scissor columns, which of course are lateral stability, et cetera, uh, uh, were, 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 were also for places to sit and to keep your head from banging into this edge. Uh, the stair becomes a kind of event space for students, et cetera. Everyone always asks what this material is. It's paint, so very <laughs> expensive material. Paint on plaster, it's very exquisite. We studied it a very long time. <clears throat> you know, this is a welded wire mesh, just off the shelf stuff. <clears throat> I just, did, I hate saying, I hate it when architects do this, but I'm going to say it anyway. This was done for half an LA unified budget, you know, which I hate, I hate saying that. It sounds like such an excuse, you know, right? Uh, but it was, you know, very tough to do. <laughs> I'll just go through these. Of course, it's a big uh, lunch area, a huge, uh, very, very, an area. <clears throat> when you do schools like this, <clears throat> it's really easy to satisfy them in some ways. I mean, schools like this, they don't have air conditioning, they don't have heat, they don't even really have electricity. So you just give them just the basic stuff, they're extremely happy. Um, uh, but here, uh, just by the position of the building and the roof, uh, in an area of the city, which uh, uh, in the summers and, and of course September and end of June gets really hot, uh, this became this kind of uh, piece. And then, of course, the room has to have a window in it, so it has an opening. It has to turn the edge, because it has to define that kind of sixth edge. <clears throat> and so, um, I'll run through this, but uh, that's the interior of the, the, the main space. So well, what was really interesting, and uh, uh, they called us up and said, oh, you have to come over. We're, 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 we're going to uh, uh, have a ceremony at the building. Um, and, and I love that they did this. Uh, the, the outside space, which they didn't want um, or didn't think they needed or didn't get um, at first, became this kind of public space. And so <clears throat> they used it actually for events, and in this case, uh, a religious ceremony, which was quite interesting, and I, I, I just love that, right? They like, put these ribbons over this, yeah, I mean, we didn't, <clears throat> we never talked about that. It was a complete kind of consequence of the project, and things like this, right? Kids just find ways, which is uh, really, I just love. This is another project, uh, uh, a boys and girls club here in East LA that we did a, a very, um, uh, uh, yeah, it was dear to our hearts, didn't get built. Um, dilapidated old bow truss building that had been around uh, about 80 years uh, next to a pool, uh, a pool in uh, uh, a place where there aren't many pools, and I'll talk about that in a minute, and then an empty lot. Uh, amazing program. They take kids 7 to 17 uh, basically off the streets for free, and some of these kids are just walking around alone uh, after school and in summers. 
Uh, and uh, they have a gymnasium in there, they have a, a wood shop, they, they have art programs, all these different activities. Um, and it was really interesting to work with them. We did a study, and this was great for their marketing, uh, which was we figured out that in uh, Boyle Heights, where this was, there's one pool per 10,000 people. And uh, which one is it? Yeah, West Covina, it's like one in 60 people. In Beverly Hills, it's like one in three. <laughs> and so we would do this comparison, which meant that the existing pool was quite important to the project and, and, and of course, the summer activities for the kids, etc. We were interested in something that came out of actually the existing building and uh, the, the morphology of the conoid shape, which is, uh, uh, you know, if you know these buildings, it's a rectangular shape that mediates between the bow, the bow truss, uh, and the rectangle, which makes a kind of conoid form, which is uh, uh, basically made out of straight lines, right? Uh, we took that and kind of decided to use that as a d departure point, both because it was fairly logically easily translated into a, a, a surface that, that we thought could deal with a single surface project that took the continuity of movement through it and collected the various spaces. There was a new community room, create the courtyard, uh, facilitate movement in and around circulation, et cetera, within the project. So the studies of this diagram shows it better. Uh, taking that as a leaving off point, this became the, the full surface that's then kind of carved out. Uh, display areas are, are created, a courtyard around the pool facilitates parking, a new object on the edge. It's simultaneously connected to the existing as well as creating this kind of new identity, uh, which was really part of the project. And then these are just drawings of it. You see the organization of the kind of entry here. It's a very interesting uh, situation. Parents aren't allowed in there um, because it's just for kids. So in the community, you get, uh, there's a gate here. You, uh, this happens now with the pool. Uh, parents get lawn chairs and sit on the sidewalk and watch their kids because the kids are in, in, in the pool. So things like that, dealing with that opening, uh, this kind of gallery that became the front of the building as it deforms and makes an entry. It deforms, cuts down, makes the, the exit stair for the community room and a canopy at the entry point of the, of the parking. <clears throat> and because we care about this stuff and, and talk about it, economy of means, we got it down to six curved beams. So if you could make this project, I think it was six, one, two, three, four, five, yeah, that's right, six. Six curved beams was what we said. All we need is six curved beams. Everything else can be wood, can be straight, can be plywood. Uh, uh, and uh, like I said, we made those arguments, but they obviously didn't take hold because we didn't build the project. But uh, here you see those kind of studies looking at the ruled surface, looking at structural implications, project in the neighborhood, And this uh, idea that the student objects that they create would be displayed in the windows of the, of the edge. The community room at the corner. I always tell this to, to my students, when you, when you get projects like this, always take pictures of the actual people from the building and put them in. These are all the kids actually from the pool. It works great for fundraising too when you're trying to get money for your projects. And this image too, again, low res, kind of quick image, but uh, the fact that the, 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 the building itself made a kind of portal for parents who, like at Christmas time, line up to have their kids come in to get gifts, et cetera. So this project, um, another SIRC project, I think the last SIRC project uh, from a few years ago, this was our installation. Of course, I hope everyone's seen Ramiro's, which is really amazing. Uh, you know, I always felt that the um, Syrac exhibitions, uh, we used to say, well, you can choose to use what limited funds you have, and you could buy a watch with it, and you could put it in the space, right? Uh, or you could buy a whole lot of stuff <laughs> and try to grab the whole space. Well, this was in the category of grabbing a whole lot of stuff. Um, and uh, uh, we had some interest, so you'll see the formal language, of course, is, is similar to the Boys and Girls Club using this kind of ruled surface conoid shape. Um, we were interested in sod grass, 
right? And we developed this installation that took sod, which is manufactured, right, uh, out in farms all around Southern California. It's cut, it's thin, it comes in two by four panels, just like ceiling tile. It's about a dollar a square foot, so it's really uh, very cheap and ex inexpensive. And we decided to kind of make a commentary on the, on the ubiquitous nature of grass within our world and the suburban kind of environment. At the same time, there's no green anywhere near Cyark, as we all know. So internalizing it was also interesting to us. Uh, and I'll talk about that in a bit. Um, and so to quickly go through it, uh, the shape of it, while uh, like all of these kind of things as a kind of folly, we looked at it as a kind of uh, uh, almost Japanese rock garden where when you walk around the object, you can never quite see the whole piece. So the dance of the forms as they move tried to entice one to move in and around the object. And ultimately, if you can, I mean, to me, these kind of things are, are incredibly important. Can you make a shape where you'd make someone walk up the stairs? In other words, they'd be so frustrated that they couldn't quite get the whole reading of the object that they would move up to the balcony. And so these were the kind of uh, uh, aims in terms of the continuity of movement that we were dealing with. Mock-ups in the office, the final piece. Um, we put a, a fluorescent line at four feet uh, at the level which represented if you filled that whole room with water, that would be one year's worth of water for this, this grass. Um, tectonically, it's uh, a floating carpet. It's uh, completely suspended from the ceiling. Uh, it's about a ton of material suspended on two plywood beams uh, on one-inch pipes. In certain areas, it wants to reach the water, but it's not allowed to. It's like it wants a drink. Um, but the, more importantly, the reflectivity of the water pans. Talked about this underside vis-a-vis uh, -vis lighting and reading the object from below. <clears throat> the ceilings were, or the walls rather, were peppered with these kind of uh, Harper's Bazaar uh, or Harper's Index of uh, 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 stats on uh, the negative impacts of, of sod and grass on the environment. And the view from the top. And then, of course, the opening. One of the uh, amazing things that happened, and of course, these installations are up for a couple of months, and this was completely unpredictable to us, was this. Um, of course, all the aims we took to eliminate the panelization of the material and celebrate its thinness, um, it turns out it shrunk. And not only shrunk, it didn't change color. It actually stayed strangely green. So it kind of repanelized <clears throat> by the end. It just dried up, of course, and, and, and then move when we deal with our organic materials, this occurs, uh, which we actually liked in, in some ways a little bit better. And it created a whole different kind of surface below and a kind of quality of this kind of cracked landscape. <clears throat> this project was a competition for the um, Schindler House. Um, this was organized by Peter Neuber and uh, Eric Moss uh, uh, a couple years ago. Um, it was a project that asked for a wall. It asked for a wall next to the Schindler house because there was gonna be another house next door and somehow this was going to ruin the Schindler house. I didn't agree with the competition brief or the, the, even the whole idea of it um, to me. Uh, then we started thinking about it a little bit and decided to do the competition. And, and, and I would say that this competition is a direct critique of the competition itself in some ways. Um, here, as we all know, is the urban condition of, of the Schindler House on King's Road. Um, I'm missing a slide that showed the house in its original state. In its original state, when it was built in 1922, it was on the edge of the development of the city. It was in the bean fields. Uh, it was the cheap land where the architects went to build their houses, right? Um, of course, today, completely different. Zoning laws change, et cetera, and 45-foot height limit. Uh, buildings uh, from the 60s, housing, et cetera, have subsumed what was once basically a house meant for an open plain, right? So 
we started thinking about the house and started thinking about you know all the different activities. Well, many of us have lectured there. People get married there. It's a kind of event space now. Of course, no one lives there anymore. It's run by the Mac. It's a gallery. Uh, one could say that the house is a kind of artifact for the city, like a piece in a museum. And it's used that way. And maybe it needs to be completely reinvented and completely rethought. We didn't think a wall or a garden on one edge uh, would even solve those kind of band-aid band on you know, losing a limb or something. So we came up with an idea, we called it paradox box, that there was a paradox actually with the problem. So the urban condition is intruding on this house that everyone loves and wants to preserve. Yet the paradox may be to recontain the house itself and treat it as an artifact. So we made a proposal, and you'll, you'll see in that sketch up above, to dig the whole site out, down 45 feet, and build up 45 feet, a structure that encapsulated the house and actually uh, uh, reacquainted us with that as an object within the city as a kind of piece of art. So we came up with this uh, double helix ramp system and because I also get crazy about things like this, it all works with handicapped 30 feet <laughs> landings, one in 12, all of that. Calculated all that out. So this actually, you go up one way to the roof and then come down the other way, all the way down under the ground and then back up again. So it's this continuous loop of movement as a diagram. And the house then would be underpinned. We'd put steel beams under there and we'd excavate the entire site, the garden's gone. And this form, which is, becomes this play then between the kind of strict uh, rectilinear notion of the uh, 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 movement with this kind of webbing and an, and an other interest in reinterpreting the concrete of the existing house, which of course is famous for its tilt up, uh, that this would be a new kind of concrete surface that was uh, both uh, uh, arches and openings and beams that was very simple that then went to a rooftop garden. So the garden wasn't necessarily in the wall. But what it did was then when you moved around and in, there was a purposeful blurring of when you're on a ramp, whether you're on the outside of the urban fabric or whether sometimes you're on the inside observing the house. So there's this play that the building becomes this kind of filter between I'm understanding what the urban condition is surrounding the site as well as seeing the object as a kind of ship in the bottle. So the study was very uh, straightforward in that way. And then the bottom of the project we proposed to be a big lecture hall. So the bottom of it is this raked theater that uh, uh, basically the ceiling uh, 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 of the house is the top and it's all open air. There's no enclosed space. And these are the elevations, of course. Models. The kind of top, rooftop garden is this kind of big aperture looking down. And then these images show what I'm talking about of, of whether one's outside the system or within the system. And of course, uh, your relationship to the house completely changes. There'd be bridges on either side so you could still go in the house laterally north to south. And the section, of course, with the theater and then the ghost of Schindler and family kind of hovering here uh, on the top. Um, sorry. See, I go quickly. I'm burning through this stuff. Uh, this is a small project uh, that we did uh, uh, right here in Los Angeles, it was a church. We were asked to look at reimagining uh, uh, the interior of a little church on West Adams. Um, it's called Bright Mount. Uh, uh, and it's a, actually kind of nice uh, 1950s building designed by uh, a, a Polish immigrant. It's a Polish Catholic church. Um, and this is, uh, it's been untouched since basically 1958, something like that. It's uh, not going to go into too much of the detail, but um, we dove into this project and there was some very interesting uh, ritualistic pieces within the church 
that we found fascinating. We've never done a museum, but this was the closest thing to a museum in a lot of ways, because there is sculpture, there are uh, uh, certain relics, there's a chair that Pope John Paul, somebody sat in once that's here. There's all these pieces that are very dear to them. So for us, it became a kind of museum project. And then, of course, they came in complaining about things like bad lighting and we can't change the light bulbs and all this stuff. And uh, in, in talking to the, the uh, uh, priest there, too, we, we were interested in something else. He made a comment. He said, you know, young people, when you're doing this stuff, are always in the back and the old people are always in the front. He said, I want the young people to be in the front. And that was something that's kind of stuck in our heads. So simple project, single form that modulates light and within the geometry of the project attempted to actually bring people forward in a kind of counterintuitive way. Of course, we all know church design and, 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 and this, this kind of project, it tends to go up as you approach, right, the end, God, etc. We took an, uh, another idea, we said, what if you went lower? So the whole project was this continuous, uh, that's a kind of structural line, here's a, the plan of the church. If you took a surface, you bent it, it becomes the organizer for the different artifacts, and you push it down, so the form actually lowered, then went up, so that it enticed you to know what is up there, actually to bring one forward. So this is the kind of final shape. <clears throat> All sorts of ritual things. There was a special painting that this church had that was kind of interesting that the, uh, at the end of the axis, on center, the painting was there. A very special, it's a remake of an, a, a real painting that's uh, in Poland, that's in every Polish church, apparently. Um, and then these studies. So here you see this form that comes up. It comes, it makes this kind of clear story. It bounces light from the south, looking at different lighting studies, et cetera, that it would actually low to the end. And this is the final, final piece. This project uh, is a house. Um, it's a house uh, was completed a couple of years ago. It's um, in Point Doom. Point Doom is a part of Malibu. It's an interesting place in that, um, well, it's a very wealthy community, of course, as most of us know. Uh, this is north up, right? So it's a part of the California coast where we're always thinking the beach is somehow facing west, uh, but th it's not at this point. Uh, and our client purchased a property here, a fairly large piece of property, about uh, 450 feet deep uh, uh, and fairly wide, on one of the highest points of Point Doom that had an amazing uh, view of the water. We were interested in creating a house that wasn't a destination as such. It was a, almost a house that you walked through. Uh, I remember uh, talking to the client about it. He was a guy who's constantly on the move. It was, a, it was for a bachelor, actually, I should say. Um, because why is that important? Uh, because it was designed for a bachelor and then he got married in the house when we, when we built it. Uh, uh, and, and now they just sold it, actually. So uh, now there's a new owner we have to meet. Uh, but for him, it was about not only connecting to the view and all of that, which you'll see, uh, but it was about a continuity of circulation from driving up this long driveway uh, dealing with fire roads, etc., entering a house on the back and moving through it towards the view. In this essence, the house is a continuous pathway that is just something you enter and exit as one goes through. This is, uh, that's actually the house right there, built. So you can see the views were uh, almost uh, 200 degrees, something like that, uh, the edge. So the plan of purposely blurring uh, landscape, which, which we were able to design um, uh, with the interior volumes, you drive up this driveway, you come around, you're presented with this entry to the house at a high level, uh, you park in the garage or you come in the formal entry, slip down to the open living dining and the pool engaged out towards the view, um, uh, or take up a, a kind of side entrance 
uh, up here off the garage up to this kind of central area. And the, the last project I'll show tonight, I think, develops some of these ideas further about a kind of confluence of movement within the house where all the activity occurs. Of course, it has to cater to kind of fairly simple kind of bedrooms, etc. Uh, in this case, the geometry peeling away to both sneak views out in the back bedrooms, the open kind of deck and bath area here, but the whole path of movement is about this sliding in and out, sliding in and out of the house. These kind of diagrams, which I think are, are very helpful to us, where, where we're looking at the volumetric connections and where those uh, areas of conflict are occurring and, and, and where in the house the kind of hot spots are, in this case, internally in that uh, central volume. So these slides uh, kind of take you from uh, the, the, the entry of the house through inside and, and out in, in a kind of sequence of how we envisioned it. So you know we're at the back of the house, looking forward, you're seeing these kind of fluted openings that you'll see later internally to the slot which takes you through the geometry to this kind of main hall that deforms and, and turns a corner to entice you back and around towards the water and the living room. Uh, the central space, uh, Tibetan bells, not by us. Uh, and then one of those bedrooms where we're sneaking a kind of view, this peeling out, this kind of cheating in a way of, uh, this is what real, real estate people would say, ocean view room, right? You know, this is your hotel room. You say, what the hell? This is this little piece. Uh, but it's, you know, one of those, you know, always kind of uh, using the geometry in service of, of opening up uh, that kind of movement. Looking back, through the main hall in this bedroom. We've been doing more and more of the landscape uh, for our clients and it's something particularly Margaret has been uh, really, really pushing and it's been really wonderful to be able to take on that, particularly for residential projects, to be able to uh, integrate that and not have to uh, sometimes butt heads with other collaborators. Uh, this is a, a research project that I'm gonna show that uh, I did a couple years ago. I was lucky enough to get a grant. And it started, it actually started, uh, you know, every once in a while you see a presentation and someone will show you an architect and you don't know the architect and you get embarrassed that you don't know the architect. And this happened to me. Someone showed me an image of Conrad Voxman's work and I said, who's that? I've never seen that. And uh, someone explained it to me and I got very interested in his work. Uh, he was an architect who, came to the United States uh, uh, during World War II, uh, emigrated out of Germany uh, through France. Walter Gropius sponsored him. Famous for his prefabrication, space frames, um, didn't build much, did some uh, prefab houses with Gropius which to some success. Actually ended up in Los Angeles in 1960 and, and died here in 1980. There was one project that he did called Study of a Dynamic Structure. And what interested me in it, and uh, these are slides from his book, was both what I thought was a, a very contemporary issue in architecture today, uh, as well as a kind of uh, disbelief that this had been done in 1957 in this case. Uh, this is a project he did with a bunch of students at IIT when he was there. And what's interesting, I have to give you some background of his work, he was interested in connections, all sorts of connections in a very tectonic way. Um, he was interested in Fortis notions of uh, mass repetition. Uh, this was the era of systems and understanding systems design and they, he truly believed that that was uh, the architecture of the future. Here he did a project which actually, which actually could be argued was antithetical to what his life's work was. And he only worked on it a little bit and then stopped. It's sometimes called the grapevine project 
where he tried to come up with a structure that, again, is repetitive. It's made out of really two pieces, a wishbone and a beam. Um, where our work sits in that, I think, is something we're grappling with. Uh, because of course the day-to-day -day, buildings are made of stuff and there are connections and we have to deal with it. But this project uh, particularly, so, so I got a little bit of money and uh, with some students, I went to Berlin, I went through his archives, uh, we studied actually three of his projects, I'm just showing one, uh, and we tried to rebuild just from these drawings the geometric principles that, that he had laid out set some rules that were used to, they had to be developable surfaces, et cetera, which required uh, some difficulty in the object. Part of it was trying to prove whether or not uh, this structure, which he did drawings like this, just in pen and ink uh, perspectives, uh, was palpable or, 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 or realizable. It turns out it was, but it took some difficulty to do. And so a series of uh, kind of diagrammatic drawings and analytical. This is Voxman's work that we're kind of analyzing and, and, and drawing and posing in a different way uh, as an alternative, uh, uh, perhaps more contemporary notion of what structure can be. And this is something I've brought to the uh, materials lab seminar that I'm teaching uh, 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 with students uh, this spring and hopefully we'll build a structure somewhere on the on the grounds that may uh, talk about some of these principles. So uh, uh, a kind of maniacal uh, drawing and uh, uh, analysis uh, through 3D modeling of how this kind of grapevine structure worked, uh, looking at it, I mean just to give you an idea, this is, uh, this would be a 60 by 60 foot kind of cube, these are like 12 foot floors, etc. Studying uh, these different pieces, and then kind of remaking his famous kind of perspectival uh, uh, drawing and re-looking at it. We had animations, and then of course uh, modeling it. So um, I'm still kind of fascinated with him, and it's uh, something still we'll, we'll probably pursue in some kind of project, but um, it's, uh, 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 I think sometimes useful when one gets the opportunity to um, pick up where other research has left off. I don't think, I think other disciplines do that quite well. I think architecture doesn't always do that. And um, for someone who practices so much, having an opportunity to uh, uh, really take time out and study something uh, really extensively was, was really wonderful. This is the last project I'm going to show you. This is uh, a project we've been working on for a few months now. You know, when you do residential houses for people uh, and work, it's extremely personal. Um, it's some of the most difficult work. And, and many architects, uh, I remember Tom Maines here, I remember when I worked with him one day, he said, you know, no more houses, you know. Um, and that was probably a really smart thing. I haven't learned that lesson yet. Every once in a while we'll say that, no more residential work. Because it's so personal, it's, uh, it's very different um, uh, in terms of, well, I, I say it this way. You know, if you have a client who says, you say, well, this is how you're gonna enter uh, your house and you're gonna move through space like this. And then they'll say, yeah, but um, when I enter my house, I get my mail, I go backwards like this and I do that, right? And you can't argue with that. So you, you, you can say, don't do that, right? And they say, but that's what I do, and it's my house, right? So doing a, a rhythm, it can be, it's extremely satisfying on another level, and certainly we've taken advantage of that, because we're allowed to build and test some ideas. So the reason I say that is, uh, and I don't know if, it, I might have some clients in the audience, I hope I haven't insulted them, but um, uh, you know, just when you're about to say no more residential work, somebody comes and says, will you do 57? And you go, oh, okay, yeah, I'll do 57. <laughs> Let's, we'll try 57. So this is a developer in Chengdu, China. Uh, this is the city of Chengdu. There is a, a north-south road. They actually only have one uh, major piece of public transportation, a train that goes, goes that way. And, um, our site is here, it was a former agricultural area where these developers have built a series of uh, other projects. And they came to us and said, well, would you like a, a piece of our, our development? So this is their city that they're designing. 
Uh, this is our site right here, so that's 57 houses. So each one of these is filled with stuff. It's a new lake, it's a dam, a former agricultural area. The former mounds of uh, the area have been uh, 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 reappropriated as, as new land. Um, and here's the main road that comes through and then it bisects left and right. We actually, uh, recently they gave us another piece right here and we started working on that as a, as a kind of mixed use project. And uh, Margaret and I were there in November, and I'll show uh, one slide of, of the island such as it is, because they're still grading the site while we're designing, um, uh, and, and some things are under construction. Uh, they just called and said, well, uh, yeah, your project's on hold because we might move the road. And apparently the mayor wants the road to go through the center of the site <laughs> instead of left and right. So I don't know, these things are always in flux. But we were there, that's really there, there's water there, there's land, they are building stuff. Uh, a, a lot of other uh, Los Angeles architects are actually working there and doing different pieces in different stages of construction. So we're very excited to be able to work on the project. This is their site model in the country club uh, on an adjacent property. Uh, again, somewhat uh, it's strange that these are under construction, so they're building the model. This looks like a golf course, but these are all filled with houses. Of course, and then the new city uh, back here that, that I don't know, we're not allowed to touch. Somebody else is doing that, the, that piece. So here's our little uh, island with a bridge and connection. And uh, the island was dictated to us. We couldn't change that. And, and then we we're given these kind of uh, lot dimensions and these kind of mini villa programs which strangely enough for such a kind of suburban location is actually um, quite urban as I think you'll see. So this is the site. Uh, this is getting leveled back there uh, uh, so that the main entry is about four meters above water level. So this is our site plan. Um, these projects are filters. They're filters from the street to the water. Um, we were interested in both the movement from entering the house and exiting. So of course each one has water view. And then we were also interested in something else, this kind of side yard condition. Meaning that not only, we didn't, uh, uh, there isn't a front and back per se, but a side. And that the projects are developed about this movement both internally in within these kind of family and there's six different basic types of villas that we're dealing with um, that in combination make these kind of side yard shared spaces questioning the kind of straight property line of this property versus that and they are for sure real property sold um, uh, 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 and, and in that way then kind of in, in, in this diagram we're looking at this is the open space between each villa as it is. Further, they not only is it a filter from one to the other, and then it's a kind of dance between moving and creating open space and then reaching the water. Internally within each villa is a kind of confluence of that geometry which takes place inside. So there's a relationship between that kind of geometry and the side yard that I showed here that's exterior space versus internal. In the sense that buildings are more straightforward on either end and more complex in the middle where all that movement takes place. So here it is, there's the, the neighborhood. It's uh, two story buildings on top of a, a, a basement level. The basement is, is uh, mediating between the four meter road above here and the water's edge. So, uh, um, they open up on the water and embed it in the back, and then these are this kind of family of pieces. Um, I'm not gonna show much landscape involved with these, although uh, we're working with uh, Orange Street with, uh, uh, in Los Angeles, developing uh, the landscape in between. There'll be a few images I'll show, kind of renderings for the client that talk a little bit about the idea of the landscape. But suffice to say, uh, uh, it is integrated with uh, trees and green space all in between. Uh, and the images I'll show you are more brutally architectural, um, more emphasizing the form and how the deformation of each villa in this kind of family of, of kind of fish uh, uh, of, of creating open space from, from water to street. 
So this is a model of three of them. Each one has a kind of pool. It has to mediate uh, the move ex exterior stairs that take you down to the water. There'll be docks, etc. cetera. Um, uh, in this case, you're looking at one where it's deforming to the side and creating this exterior area. This one deforms and creates an object out of the master bedroom and living area with a bridge and a kind of carved space in. In a way, it was um, making almost a, uh, Oh, uh, it's very interesting because I have to say, um, the client, they're all architects. So there's like a whole department of architects hiring other architects to do speculative building with no clients yet. Um, uh, 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 a series of houses. And the reiteration after reiteration has been unbelievably intense. Drawing upon drawing upon sketch, kind of revision to revision, revision, <laughs> revision, revision. And I'd say that in some ways the projects as they are now, and this is just hot off the press of what came out of the office recently, um, has been about developing a language that actually could adapt to many of these internal things. Is the kitchen big enough? Is the living room big enough? Where's the home theater? I, need, I want another bedroom. I want another piece. And that we were able to, within that, not, I'm not going to say train, but they adopted almost uh, what we were going after in that they started to play by the rules. So the, the suggestions weren't make it a triangle, you know, doesn't work. That suddenly then in the give and take through the collaboration, well, let's move it here, let's push it here, let's push it there, let's move it here. Now, besides like every architect's nightmare of tracing those changes constantly, which we started to get a little bit better at, at least when it was within the, the, the language that we were looking for and this fluidity of space from front to back, we're okay. So here are the, the final slides. I'll just run through the basement plans. And in this case, I'm just taking six of them and showing you. Don't look for any sustainability here. I mean, this is, you know, two car garages, five, 6,000 square foot villas uh, for the new reach of China. However, it's much denser than you would get in a typical uh, uh, kind of neighborhood here. I mean, the, as you saw, the verticality of the spaces and the tightness of the lots, they're almost touching in some ways. Strangely enough, they're like type one buildings. They're made out of concrete, concrete columns. Uh, you'll see us in these images looking at materiality. Uh, stone was required. Um, uh, of course, we're modeling all that stuff heavily embedded in proving that one can make these forms uh, with some economy of means. And I just like this slide because, uh, as I said to the people in the office, this is the stuff that you guys work on that no one ever shows. And so you can imagine the amount of work that we go through um, um, uh, rationalizing geometry, understanding in this case a heavy concrete frame whose spans are much smaller than we are used to. Um, and then these are the kind of views of, of these different types as, as we're looking at kind of uh, varying materiality, as we're looking at some that enter from the side, others that enter through the middle, uh, another one in the middle, another one there. Some of these images that, that, that uh, again, are used to uh, connect uh, from a more user-friendly level. But, but in this edge, you see the busting out of the house towards those side yards, edges, integration of water inside and out, the, the migration of landscape pieces within the houses and the forms themselves, the deformation of movement, in this case, a bridge from the master bedroom to a guest suite.
In conclusion, this image represents maybe our attitude about our work. Always keep moving, keep jumping. Most of all, don't look down. Thank you, Cyark. Thank you.